Father, it truly is amazing to consider how blessed we are because of you. Father, it's our prayer that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each and every one of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scriptures for this weekend paint a very interesting picture of where real greatness is found. As I've been studying these scriptures in preparation for today, and as I've been very heavily engaged in coaching my sons in football uh, over the past month, God's been wrestling with me. Uh, as you know, I played football. Can you tell? Right? Okay. This isn't just for show. You know, it's functional, right? But there's a very important question that while I was still playing football, God spoke to me about. When I was a senior in high school and then into my college years, uh, as I played football at Brown University and I was an All-American there and captain of the team and all that, the question that God wanted me to wrestle with in my life was, where does real greatness, how do you find it? How does it come about? Where do you really find greatness? And the scriptures for today speak right to it. Very simply spoke, spoken, submitting to the divine authority of God is where greatness is found and nowhere else. So we can kind of close that sermon up and we're done, right? Because each and every one of us are hardwired by God, I believe, to desire greatness, aren't you? How many of you really want your life to matter for something? Right? But we can go looking for it in all the wrong places when Jesus is trying to make it abundantly clear for us. Not only through him coming to earth and his life and death and his teaching and his resurrection. He wants us to get it. You see, we're going to start this morning by looking at the gospel. And Jesus is wrestling once again with the Pharisees. You know, the people who were supposed to be the leaders of his, you know, of his people who were supposed to get it. They were supposed to be able to not only live the faith, but to explain it to others in a way that was compelling and life-giving. But it was anything but. And Jesus, time and time again, came up against them and their teaching. And here is but another one of those times. But again, listen very closely to the keys to how real greatness is found. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples, okay, we might catch them here, eating food with hands that were unclean. How many of you are feeling a little guilty right now? Do you eat food with hands that are unclean? Come on. Okay, we're all going to hell in a hand. No, no, no. Okay. Thank the Lord because, you know, my football training didn't prepare me for it. Anyway, here we go. Okay. He saw them, that is, you know, they were unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. You know, a good thorough scrubbing. Holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Again, in and of themselves, sound like pretty good, important things to do, right? You need to speak now. Right, good, good. But if they start to become for you, like it can for any one of us, the litmus test of somebody's devotion to God, and now we're in trouble. Does that make sense to you? So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus a question. They thought they had him. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? What's going on here, Jesus? This is his reply. And I want to, you to put as best you can yourself into the shoes of the Pharisees right now because I believe a little Pharisee lives inside of each and every one of us. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips. You know, they show up to church, they sing songs, it's good stuff. But their hearts 
are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. One of my favorite scriptures is this. A humble and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. A humble and contrite heart. Somebody who comes submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life and says, teach me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. Empower me, Lord. Because apart from you, I can do nothing. Somebody who knows, as one of my mentors used to love to say to me, Jace, the foot of the cross is amazingly level. The ground is amazingly level at the foot of the cross. Don't you love having a big old cross like this in church? You do understand if we were all to approach it, we'd be on the same ground. All beggars in need of his grace. All people who have wandered far from God, yes? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Right, so the Pharisees lost touch with that. By the way, again, there's a little Pharisee that lives inside of me. I very easily can lose touch with that, and so can you. We can start to think of ourselves as more holy than other people, can't we? We can go, well, at least we go to church and those other people, you know, those ones. Be careful. Do not judge unless you want to be judged. I don't want to be judged like that, so I'm going to pull out of that equation. I know that there is not a perfect person standing before you today. But you knew that, didn't you? Maybe it's hard for you to imagine a little bit. I get it. I get it. <laughs> don't even try. It's bad. But by the grace of God, he leads and empowers and teaches us all how to really live. If only our hearts would be fully his. If only our hearts. So that's the first principle for today. If you want to know where real greatness is found, submitting to divine authority, it's, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It always has been. It always will be. Several places throughout scripture, he talks about when your heart is fully mine, then you'll know the abundant life. One of my favorites, Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys are probably very familiar with this, right? I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Remember? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Sounds really good until you keep reading, right? When you finally believe that, then you will seek me. And you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. When it's my will be done, the Lord's will be done, over our will be done. When you're truly submitted to the authority of God in your life, you will find the life that the Bible talks about. Guaranteed, by the way. Guaranteed. Here's Jesus continues. They worship me in vain. The Pharisees are wasting their lives, Jesus is saying. It's in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You've let go, this is very important here, You've let go of the commands of God. You stopped living under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus. And you're holding on to the traditions of men. Now this is especially dangerous in a church. Because the drift from the commands of God to the traditions of men is very fast. The traditions of men are all self-serving. The commands of God are all self-sacrificing. That's how you can know the difference. Makes sense. For example, one of the hardest things for us as Christians to do is to bear witness for our faith. Would you agree? To bring up the conversation of Jesus in other people's lives in a relevant, real, but compelling way, right? You feel like you're putting the relationship at risk and oh my gosh, they're going to think I'm the Bible guy or, you know, the weird guy or, or gal. Correct? And so very quickly we rationalize, don't we? I mean, how good are you at rationalizing? Let's be, you know. Well, I don't want to offend them, so I just won't start. That is a tradition of men. We do it pretty good here, don't we? We all together go, well, nobody else is witnessing, so I won't either. Well, wait a minute. It's a clear command of Christ. I must be a witness to the hope that lives within me. Everybody who I meet, especially people that I've come to pray for and build prayer-filled relationships with, will I start the spiritual conversation? Will I help them go, there is a hope for you that you must know, you must know it. And even if you think I'm weird, I'm willing to go through that barrier because Jesus loves you, this I know. 
And that's as simple as I get. You know, I'm coaching football right now with my boys, as I mentioned. Did I mention that? Good, all right. I can never remember what I say. But anyway, and I'm coaching. This is like a weird thing happening in my life. Because, you know, I was went away for 21 years on the East Coast, being a pastor and all that, right? And now I'm coaching with people I played with 25 years ago. And I'm looking at the trajectory of people's lives. And I'm looking at how different my life is because I'm, as best I can, I'm not perfect, but living under the authority of God. And how he's turning me into somebody who wants to give my life away versus somebody who's just doing it all for their own glory. And again, not doing it perfectly, please remember. But how much more alive and rich and, and now I'm being challenged by God to go, well, make sure they know it too. Will you get out of your comfort zone and share the love of Jesus with them? So you can hold me accountable to that, okay? You actually have to say something. Okay, you're good. Here we go. So the next one is this. Do you really believe that Christ is Lord of all? That God's authority supersedes all other authority in the world. All authority. And therefore we submit to the authority of God over men. You know, the guy who started our denomination, Luther, he had a very difficult situation that he found himself in. You do understand that Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, right? So quit bashing the Catholics. Be nice. And his intention the whole time was to reform, thus the Reformation, reform the church. To do what? To bring it more in alignment with the revealed will of God in Scripture. And back then, the Pope was the Pope. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was a big deal. And he's going, listen, I know I must submit to the authority of the Pope because I believe in authority, and it's good. Only if that authority is submitted to the authority of God, though. Again, revealed clearly in the Bible, in his revealed will. And so that's, compelled by the Holy Spirit, that's what Martin Luther did. He confronted human traditions, which were many including indulgences and all kinds of junk that crept in to the holy faith. And he said, I don't see this in the word. I don't see that in the word. And he pins the theses on the door and thus begins a very interesting time in history. Now, I bet you his hope was that, you know what's going to happen? The Pope, who has a humble and contrite heart, will see the Holy Spirit's work and he will humble himself and there'll be a new day. It'll be good. It didn't play out like that. They tried to kill him. Actually sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because who's leading the charge to kill Jesus? You see, by placing your life under the authority of God, you will move towards giving your life away and away from self-centeredness and what's in it for me thinking. That's what Jesus does to us who are his followers Becoming like him. If so be, even unto death. Does this make sense? And here's my proclamation to you. That is the best life possible. That is greatness embodied. Not only in Jesus Christ, but in every follower who is willing to submit. And however God wants to live out through you, you follow. But it will be a life of giving your life away. Very clearly. And Jesus continued... And he said to them, he's about to drop a nuke, by the way. Here we go. This is a biblical smackdown, okay? That was trying to be contemporary and fun. Okay, here we go. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Ooh. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. That's pretty clear and direct, right? So be nice to your mommies and daddies. Or else. That's kind of fun for me. Okay, anyway. Okay. So here's the reality, as I've already stated. We will all have to wrestle with the commands of God versus the traditions of men. We'll all have to wrestle with, what does God say on this versus, is this just a, the church made this up thing? Like, for example, my kids ask me from time to time, from time to time, why, daddy, why do you wear the dress? And you're all wondering too now. They never told me. They just told me to put it on. I don't know. 
That's a joke. Nobody gets it. All right. There's a reason for it. But if it becomes the reason over the authority of God, like, you're not holy unless you're wearing the rope, we've lost it. Do you get it? It's not about the traditions of men. It's about submitting to the commands of God in our lives because that's where life is found. So here's the biblical smackdown continued. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, what if, and, and they say it with a smile, by the way, to mommy and daddy, mommy, daddy, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me, you know, because it's my duty to honor and serve you, and, right? Here's the problem. It's Corbin. You know, I don't have time to serve you because I'm too busy serving God. That's what it is. Sounds really religious and nice, doesn't it, when it comes out? Except that rationalization is in direct contradiction, as Jesus pointed out, to the clear command of God to honor your mother and father. So there's no way that could be right. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And by the way, you do many things like that. Uh-oh. He'd like them to do a little introspection, a little reflection, please, on how much of what you do is actually rooted, is commanded by God. How much of your daily living is commanded by God? Praying for my children, walking by faith, not by sight, all commands. Versus, you know, I'm going to just be a good church guy or church gal. I'm going to go to church. Why? It's a tradition. I grew up in the church. Uh oh, that got a little convicting. Versus, there is life here. My heart is for you, Lord. Thy will be done. I come because I believe that I'm going to encounter a living God here today. I believe that as I expose myself to the will of God revealed in his word, that I will learn, that I will be stretched, that I will be changed. So I come to worship him with my family of faith because God's got something for us to do in this world. In the 411, you heard talk about body life basics, this seminar that's coming, right? Were you paying attention? And that you're supposed to listen up in the sermon for something about it, right? Well, here it is. God has got a plan for us. If, how many of you are members of Trinity Lutheran Church, official members of the church? And if you're not, we'd love for you to become. Everyone who just raised their hand, we are expecting you to go through the Body Life Basics training this fall or soon thereafter. You all in? Okay, here's why. Because if we're going to be the body of Christ, we all have to be singing on the same song sheet. We have to understand God's mission and how we are together going to implement his mission for our lives together. If not, we're just a bunch of people running around not really moving together. Enough said? You're all in? All right, I like that. That felt good. Principle four. Here's the reason why we need to understand the authority of God. Because there is a counterfeit authority in the world. His name is Satan. And his job is to try and deceive us into loving our own self-serving traditions over the commands of God. That's his job. And he's pretty good at it, by the way. We're easy pickings for him when we're walking in the flesh. But when we submit to the authority of God, his guidance and his power by the Holy Spirit empower us to push back the darkness and to stand with and for God. This is true, and it always will be. It's a guaranteed reality for those of us who will submit and live by faith and not by sight. So let me paint a picture for you of a very dangerous scripture, and I know you're all listening to it when it was read, so women are a little afraid right now, okay? If you're a woman, you're here, and you're a little bit nervous about the scripture, raise your hand. You're all liars. Come on, get them up. All right. Because this is, this is not looking good, like, if you don't understand it, right? Here's how it starts. Submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. Out of reverence for Jesus, who in the Trinity are completely submitted to one another. Model that in community. You get that, right? God lives in perfect community. Father submitted to the Son, Son submitted to the Father, Holy Spirit. They're all serving one another. God is love. He's always serving so out of reverence for Christ, who modeled that for you, submit one to another. And let's start it this way. Wives, 
Submit to your husbands. Yes, even him. That was funnier than you thought, but yeah, okay. But only submit to them as they are in the Lord. Which means this. Paul would say it in a different place like this. Follow me as I follow Christ. You know, Paul wasn't perfect. When he was walking in the flesh, he's saying, don't follow that stuff. When I'm walking by the Spirit, you know, God used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Follow that stuff. Follow me as I follow Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. When you see the Lord moving in and through them, submit to that. So you're actually not submitting to your husband. You're submitting to the Lord in and through them, right? Does that make sense to you? Okay. He's trying to help us understand how divine authority works in and through human relationships. For the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Again, as they are following Christ. Serving one another starts at home. It's that simple. If we're going to really be people who live our faith, it starts with the closest relationships in your life and starting to serve one another. God commands us to focus on loving and serving one another in marriage and to model this way of life for the world to watch. It doesn't get any more intimate than a relate. First it's God and us, and then if you are drawn to be married or called to be married, which not all people are, watching what God does through that covenant of marriage. It's a powerful, powerful example of the love of God on display. When it's submitted to God. When it's not, it's just awful. It's just two self-centered people trying to manipulate to get other people to give them what they want, isn't it? I wasn't describing your marriage, was I? No. I hope not. I'm always talking about those other people. It always happens that way. You see, my drift pattern is to do that. It's to create up traditions that serve me. And every time the word of God says, no, give your life away. What are you doing to serve your wife, to serve your children? Command me, Lord. Give me the strength to do it, and it, be, it will be done, because you'll do it through me, is the answer. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Jesus did everything that was needed to be done so that we might be saved. Will you do, men, everything that God guides and empowers you to do? Will you follow him and give your life away for your wife? Now you will know love. If you will purpose yourself to do that, you will know love. You will know the supernatural power of God and to present him to himself as a radiant church. You know, awesome! Without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You see, it always involves sacrifice. That's when I know I'm following the commands of God, as I said before. It will be an other-centered, give-my-life-away reality. Whenever you're not living in that place, you need to stop, you need to hit your knees, you need to pray. Lord, it seems like I'm doing things, I'm creating realities that all... It's about what I'm getting out of life rather than what you have given me and are trying to do through me to give to others. Now we're back, walking by faith, humble and contrite heart before a living God, submitted to divine authority. Because whatever authority source you're submitted to authors your life and you become like that source. And God, Jesus, came to serve, not to be served. And we will, in increasing measure as we grow, become servants and less self-centered and more servants as we grow in Christ. That's how it works. Jesus left perfection in heaven, came to earth as a man, lived a sinless life, suffered, died, and rose again so that we might be reconciled to him and know this life. Be clear on it. That is the life that is truly life. That is greatness. And it comes by living under the divine authority of God. Are you ready for the big finish? Here it is. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, because God's going to do something miraculous, 
We're going to have little boys and little girls leave their fathers and mothers and be united in marriage. And the two will become one flesh. It's a profound mystery. It's awesome. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. You see, if you understand Christian marriage, we're going to be under the guidance of God, following the example of Jesus. And we're going to move into these covenant relationships and love and serve one another so that so much life and so much love comes out of that union that people will say, wow, God must be with them. God is good. Because a couple that does that, they will give all honor and glory to God. They'll say, but for the grace of God, forget about it. We're at each other's throats. And when we're at each other's throats, we go resubmit to God. We offer forgiveness to each other. We give each other grace because God gave us grace. And they resubmit and they get it back on the path of growth again. Does that make sense? This is true for all of us. If you want greatness, this is how it's found. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Get into that place where we are serving one another. Does this make sense to you? Does it help you see how real greatness is found by submitting to the divine authority offered us through Christ Jesus? I hope so. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for living and dying and forgiving our sins. Thank you for the fact that you are above all names. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And as we submit to your authority in our lives, Father, by the way, we pray that you teach us how to do that every day. As we do this, you breathe life and love into us. Father, you teach us to give our lives away. You empower us to do it, to overcome the self-centeredness of sin and to live as children of light in a dark and dying world. Father, use us, use this church to advance your kingdom, the kingdom of light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.